This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today we are in Amiens. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello. We're coming live from... Where are we, Lionel? We are in a press centre in Amiens, which looks like a handball or volleyball uh, centre. We're sitting just away from our colleagues here. Um, and it's been a it's been a fairly sort of uh, routine day for us here in the press room, but perhaps not for the riders out on the road, and certainly not for us now because we are live, our first ever live podcast at the Tour de France. Please tweet your questions hashtag what's our hashtag TCP live TCP live hashtag TCP live to at cycling underscore podcast, but the hashtag is hashtag TCP live so keep your questions coming in we'll do a little chat about the first Daniel's looking worried already what's wrong Daniel CP live <laughs> it is it's CP live <laughs> TP the podcast live CP CP live sorry yes it is it's CP live oh we I mean this is not the most shambolic thing that's happened today um, just as we were setting up Richard sat down and, and managed to collapse his chair so that gives you an idea of uh, what's been going on here we've got three weeks to get this right we're going to do this every Wednesday during the Tour de France hashtag CP live for questions so get them coming in but we do have a stage to talk about it today as well uh, one by the gorilla Andre Greipel it was, it was as you said Lionel a pretty routine day first one really um, strong winds but uh, the wind was was often a headwind, which is not conducive to exciting racing. Really, um, there were there were crashes, there was you know there were splits, but you know pretty much all came back together. Um, Table Pino had another torrid day today, didn't he? But in Amia, it was Greipel who won ahead of Peter Sagan and Mark Cavendish. Cavendish, pretty downbeat at the finish. Um, Daniel, did you see Mark, and what did you make of his? lead out and sprint he seemed to lose Mark Renshaw's wheel what happened in the final kilometre I didn't see Mark and to be honest I didn't get a very good view of the sprint itself because I was waiting at uh, the Lotto Sudar team bus however I don't know whether he lost his wheel so much as he decided to let Renshaw go and I just wonder how much the sprint of two days ago in Holland was playing on his mind because um, he did almost take the decision it looked to me to sit back a few wheels and come off I think he tried to come off Greipel's wheel and actually you know there will be some scrutiny of the Etix quick steps lead out this evening I actually think they did a reasonably good job and it was fairly clean and although he wasn't coming right off Renshaw's wheel he did have a decent runner tick cab but you know if you look at the overhead shots his, his acceleration wasn't it wasn't vintage Cavendish um, and certainly as they came towards the line, I think the, the rider who was going fastest was Peter Sagan, but certainly Sagan and Greipel were travelling at a much faster speed than, than Cavendish. A lot of people inevitably asking the question, is, is Cavendish finished? Is he a busted flush? Um, worth pointing out that he has just turned 30. Greipel's 32. We famously, or infamously, described uh, Greipel as a, as a fading force on the eve of the tour proved spectacularly wrong we're just getting some uh, noises from the press conference there hopefully they're not interrupting things too much um but yeah Greipel the the big surprise I don't think anybody would have seen him winning two stages in the first week he's changed his approach slightly this year didn't do the tour down under I was chatting to Marcel Seberg one of his lead out men who did an excellent job today and Seberg was talking about how they changed their build up tried to come to the boil a bit um, a bit later this year and he, he really is firing on all cylinders at the Tour de France isn't he I mean Seberg and, and Greipel actually said to each other earlier in today or early on in today's stage that neither of them felt very good um, they they both were really feeling the after effects of yesterday's very tough stage um, but he really pulled out something quite special at the end didn't he and of course Cavendish and Greipel have this history um, in their days at High Road, what was at the time High Road together, they didn't have a very good relationship. Cavendish kind of used to toy with him, almost you could suggest bullied him a little bit. Cavendish would probably agree with that, um, certainly in the press, in his comments in the press. Um, but it was very much Cavendish number one, Greipel number two there, so much so that Greipel eventually had to leave that team. So 
you know their relationship actually is pretty good these days um uh, so i don't i don't think griper will feel that this is revenge in any way but certainly you know that that the, the relationship or the, the rivalry has flipped around a little bit, hasn't it? Funny, I said on Saturday that Cancellara and Tony Martin were finished. And we said that Andre Greifel was finished. They've, they've not done too badly. I think riders will be wanting us to describe them as finished in the future. Well, yeah, and the other big thing about Greipel's second win is it's Germany's third in five days. I mean, the resurgent force, no, not a fading force at all. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a strange old day, though, on the race, the fifth stage after f- four really stressful um, days, although the prologue's only short for a lot of the riders. Well, it wasn't a prologue, sorry, stage one's only short for a lot of the riders. It's a, a day when the nerves take over, and then, of course, uh, winds, rain, crashes. Um, and so perhaps it's not a surprise that it wasn't the most action-packed stage. I mean, it w- the very early stages of it today were really peculiar. Um, Pierre-Luc... Uh, Perichon, Breton, Seche got away, got maybe a couple of minutes, two and a half minutes, and it looked like the peloton was trying its hardest not to catch him, but they got him back with uh, just under 100 kilometres to go, and really that was you know disastrous for the race as a kind of you know entertaining spectacle. There was time um, for another break to go clear if anyone had fancied it, but with the wind being headwind in the finish, perhaps they thought it wasn't really worth it. So who's Cavendish going to be riding for next year, Daniel? Is it going to be Breton Seche or uh, Yam Cycling, MTN Quebec? Could be one of those three. Could be. Um, one of MTN Quebec have certainly shown some interest in him. The, there will be some fallout, I'm sure, um, in the short term from, well, today's stage. I mean, the, the Quick Step, Essex Quick Step is a team which seems to thrive on uh, sort of chaos not i wouldn't say disunity but um there have certainly been a few rumblings of discontent in that team in in different factions developing i think in last few weeks it was all it all seemed to come back together beautifully yesterday of course when tony martin took the yellow jersey but cavendish is now obviously under a lot of pressure He, he is nervous he has been nervous i don't think that's any secret about his contract he's in the last year patrick lefebvre has sometimes seemed to that's the ethics quick step manager sometimes seemed to support him publicly other times it seemed to provoke him um and i'm i wonder how much that has really had well whatever the desired effect was supposed to be presumably to to galvanize cavendish i actually think that he's he's not really benefit, benefited from being put under pressure by Lefebvre. Lefebvre saying before the tour that he would be satisfied with five victories from Cavendish. And, you know, and you look at some of the mistakes that have perhaps been made in these two sprints by Ethics and, and Cavendish, and perhaps uh, they have been slightly over-eager in, in some ways. I mean, I felt that today Cavendish would have really benefited from a very chaotic sprint in which he had to rely on his instinct, which which I think is probably still one of his greatest strengths. And it wasn't that. It was fairly clean in the end that they hit the front with about 2.5k to go. Tony Martin was on the front and uh, led them in quite nicely. And, and really, it was another one of those where perhaps Cav had too much time to think, although it looked to me as though his legs weren't weren't certainly at their sprightliest in the, in the closing 500 metres. Headwind finish, wasn't it, which you know slows it all down and does make it a bit safer and less chaotic and maybe one that didn't really suit Cavendish. But the pressure will be mounting on him. We should probably start taking questions soon. We um, are also going to be joined by uh, Chiro Scognomilio, which will be a, of huge excitement. The challenge is just going to be keeping him uh, away from the microphone enough because he does... He's, uh, uh, he could assault your eardrums if we're not if we're not careful, but we'll hold him back as much as possible at a safe distance. Um, questions? Shall we take a few questions, or should we also ask? We've had a few nominations for Peddler de Charm. Um, let's have a few more for Peddler de Charm today. There is a rollover. It's not a rollover. It's not. It's not. Um, we just didn't manage to get the start this morning. There was a cock up. None of our faults, was it? Daniel had one job to do this morning. He had one job. Ed Pickering, who is not um, participating in the podcast tonight, how long has he been doing the, the podcast? How long has he been doing the Tour de France final? Oh, I don't know. I think maybe his first one, 2002. And, and lesson one on day one is that you do not program the start town into the GPS. You program in the PPO, which is sort of the, the special filter that the traffic police create for tour vehicles to go through on their way to the start. What did Ed do? 
did he program in the start town? Did he program in the start town? Did Constantly. he do, did he do what, what you, me and Pierre Carey did in 2011 in the Vendée, which was exactly that. We, we, did, we did exactly that and ended up driving, ploughing plowing into the publicity caravan. I'm just disgusted when I see this naivety from other journalists. It really annoys me. It really riles me. And, not, and as you both know, not much really winds me up <laughs> the naivete de jeunesse um, no that is uh, we were talking the other day about the golden rules of the tour you know thing, never try and beat the tour and, and if you, you program in the start town to your sat nav that, you're trying there to beat the tour never beat the tour even if you have to drive 20 kilometres back down the road to get to the PPO you've, got to, you've just got to do that there, there, there are other, you came up with another couple line I can't remember them now yeah, never eat in a group larger than six people at a max because you're struggling. Um, you're putting pressure on an already busy restaurant and then, as happened on Saturday night in Utrecht, we waited an hour between starter and main course. I mean, Another one. Another one. I'm travelling with a group of people who, between them, have probably got 15 Tours de France. The first, thing, the first day you do the Tour de France or the second day you realise that every kitchen in every French restaurant stops serving at 10 o'clock. What did they do the, last night? Yeah, kind of lackadaisical in the press room, not a care in the world. At quarter past nine, you know, I said to them, I reminded them, Lionel, they didn't listen. We ended up in McDonald's at quarter past ten. To make matters worse, uh, Richard and I were staying at Richard's in-laws and uh, we were served delicious roast duck um, and, and, a, and a tremendous array of cheeses and wine. Um, it, was, it, was, it was so good, we're going back again tonight. That's why I broke the chair just before we went on air. <laughs> That was, that was exactly what happened. We'll get to you in a moment. Let's rattle through a few questions, shall we? Um, Julian asks, why do the media, TV media obsess over ethics so much? Greipel and Sagan have helped but do far more on their own. Why do the TV media obsess over ethics so much? Well, Camdish regularly complains, doesn't he, that it's more of a story when he gets beaten than when other, someone else wins. And today, in fact, he was being questioned at the team bus about his defeat and he said, why don't, you go, why don't you go and speak to Greipel? That's the story. That guy won. Why don't you go and speak to him? I'm not sure that that was being gracious or just wanting them out of his face. Well, and the other thing was that the, a lot of the questions posed to Greipel were about Cavendish. It, it, you know, everything does um, circulate around Mark Cavendish because of his, uh, the number of stage wins he's won in the past. Not only that, it's because he, is, uh, he can be hot-headed and, and he, he, can, he can be provoked into saying something that is a headline. That's why. He, so in that sense, he's his own worst enemy, I'm afraid. Um, next question of the three of you who gets most excited by the publicity caravan it's got to be Daniel it's got to be Daniel Daniel remember we're live you can't just pause here and, and think and, and, and ask the editor to remove that pause later you got to you know come on let's be having you why, why, why do I get so excited about the publicity caravan I don't know why do you get so excited about the publicity yeah, caravan it's not the free Haribos well, I saw the whole publicity caravan yesterday out on the cobbles. Um, a flavour of some of that will appear in a Kilometre Zero episode towards the end of the week, I think. Uh, Kilometre Zero, our new weekday morning show, which is looking at another side of the Tour de France. If you haven't caught that yet, that's all in all the usual places, iTunes and so on. But I, I think the publicity caravan it is it's wonderfully naff. It's completely outdated. It's kind of... It's like uh, when when a sort of really bad fairground comes to town, and uh, uh, don't you think? Fairground in Cortric during the during the classics and around Easter time meets, meets a school disco. <laughs> okay. Ne- next question. Rebecca has asked a couple of times. She's desperate to know how well liked is Sagan in the peloton. How well liked is Sagan in the peloton? Very well liked. Very well liked in his team. Um, he actually sort of keeps himself to himself. I think he's had some brushes with a few other riders purely because of his bike handling, because he's quite sort of outrageous, some of the things he does in the peloton. But otherwise, um, he has a very good reputation. Well, we have been joined by our friend Chiro Scognamilo. Chiro, don't go too close to the microphone because it's very sensitive and you do, sometimes you try to, try to eat it. Don't try to eat it. How are you, Chiro? Richard, fine, well, and uh, I must confess that when you told me before that I should come with you to do this podcast today, my day changed completely. Before this, I was sad. Now I'm really happy, as never in this last day. Why were you sad, Chair? Because, you know, Daniel, my life here is not easy. It's difficult because I'm far from my real needs and I try to 
get a stimulation and this podcast is a stimulation for me as as you know so to be fair we could just leave Chiro to it leave him with the mic and we could all pop off for a beer you know this is live Chiro yeah here unruffled completely this guy's so cool for me, I mean, I don't feel pressure for this. I'm happy so live. We, we could do a live of 24 hours for me. Before we go on to another listener's question, can I ask Chiro a question? Chiro was very alarmed yesterday. He was very concerned about his countryman, uh, Vincenzo Nibali, his shadow. Chiro said that, in his opinion, Vincenzo was, was pretty glum about his prospects in the Tour de France to such an extent that he would probably like to go home. Um, no, I mean, it was an exaggeration. I reflect on my words. No, it was too much. Uh, the point is uh, concerning Vincenzo Nibali that certainly in these first days of the Tour de France on the paper, uh, these days were for him, but as a matter of fact, for the moment he isn't in a good position in the GC. And so now he has to think how to recover he knows that it won't be easy, but I think he's really motivated to try to do something at least. Richard, back to some questions from our listeners. Have you got one? I've got a couple here if you're, if you're struggling. Um, the question, well, this is a simple one from Liz Marley. Uh, why are the Tour de France fines? We've mentioned these a couple of times this week. Fines for uh, urinating within sight of the public and... Uh, Yeah, to name one at random, and uh, illegal feeding, which means basically uh, taking food or drink in the final kilometres. There's all sorts of other rules and fines dished out. And Liz asked, why are the fines levied in Swiss francs and the prizes awarded in euros? Well, my answer to that is that the the fines are uh, UCI fines, levied by the UCI, which is a Swiss-based organisation, and the tour is a French organisation. So, simple as that, really. So, the, the prize money is paid out in euros. And now, Le Pédaleur de Charme, supported by British Eurosport. Shall we do our Pédaleur de Charme, British Eurosport Pédaleur de Charme? Um, Daniel has will be dispatched tomorrow to uh, Matteo Trenton to give him the Pedlar de Charme t-shirt they didn't didn't give him today. Who's our who who are nominees today? Any any suggestions, chaps? Michael Matthews was uh, again you know a crash victim looks well looks miserable. Is that a is that a, a not a, a, you know is that is that a criterion for for Pedlar de Charme? I'm really not sure. What do you think? Well, I wouldn't think so, but that wasn't how it was devised when we came up with it, you know. Um, so, uh, I mean, there wasn't a lot of charming pedalling today, to be honest, was there? there? There was only one guy in a signif- in any kind of breakaway, and, and he didn't look comfortable out there, the poor lad from Bretagne Sechet. I mean, it, he looked like he was on a hiding to nothing from, the, from as soon as the TV coverage came on. Um, and it looked like one of those ones where he must have attacked hoping some others would go with him and maybe get a three or four man breakaway going find himself out there all on his own and nothing for it um, but to press on often into the into the headwind but so maybe maybe he's a, a reasonable nomination I don't know what do you think yeah I mean there's, there's a dearth of candidates isn't there today uh, people nominate Peter Sagan every day just because I think they like Peter Sagan so will, will we try Peter Sagan we haven't gone for an A-lister yet have we we haven't gone for a real big hitter maybe we should go for Peter Sagan if I'm not mistaken, he, he bumped his front wheel uh, over the line when uh, in frustration a little bit um, on the line, a, a little bit like a, well, perhaps not very charming, but just it does show that, uh, you know, he's fired up for a, fired up to try and get a stage win. Daniel's got something, something. Chira's busy working on his story and he's just asked me, so he's written, I don't know what the story's about, but he has referred to someone eating porridge for breakfast and he's asked me and he's he's really intrigued by this, what? could porridge possibly be it's kind of like a a risotto but with oats and you eat it for breakfast you know oats are chira chris froom chris froom well yeah porridge it's oh yeah it's a good scottish meal chira you'll you'll taste porridge when you visit edinburgh in october which i know is i know is your plan are you looking forward to that yeah i hope so but richard is not the moment unfortunately because you know we have to be concentrated on the Tour de France unfortunately Richard okay, this well, is my on, on that note on that note Stuart Monroe asks is Cav in a transitional period 
not quite so explosive, becoming a better all-rounder. We mentioned his age earlier and Greipel having the upper hand at the age of 32, but Greipel is a different kind of sprinter, isn't he? He relies more on strength, whereas Camdish always relied more on speed. So what, what, you know, what is going to become of Camdish? What, what are his options at this stage, Daniel? Unfortunately, I don't really think there are too many other strings to his bow. I think he has become a much, much better climber, a much, much better all-rounder, but not to the extent where he's going to start winning races that don't finish in bunch sprints. Um, there are many riders in the peloton now who are extremely versatile and extremely fast. Peter Sagan, Michael Matthews, John Degenkolb. This has been a phenomenon that has uh, we, what well, we've seen over the last few years that this glut of riders of that ilk um, and it's very difficult for Cavendish to to really compete with those guys OK another question from Palace Chopper not sure if that's his real name um, of the riders in the Tour de France who would you like to see unshackled from domestic duties who would you most like to see unshackled from domestic duties Lionel oh. Uh, well, seeing as I've just made a little piece about domestiques, you would think the names of domestiques would be tripping off my tongue. Um, that's uh, I did a Kilometre Zero episode about the work that's done. I think w- one of the things that came out of that was that the the definition of a domestique is changing all the time. I mean, you know, Mikhail Kwiatkowski is a, is the world champion. He's capable of winning stages of the Tour de France. Um, and yet in this race he really is a super domestique he's doing legwork for the team even the same for Tony Martin today he's wearing the yellow jersey yet he's in there um, he's shackled up today working for Mark Cavendish um, there's not there's not anyone that sort of really leaps to mind uh, from from who you would say is a domestique that has you know race winning winning qualities that we that we don't get a chance to see I mean I'm not not too sure the, the, and the tour is a such a sort of strange race in that the, the leaders you know they have uh, they have all the resources put behind them the, the, the team leaders I mean somebody like Michael Matthews for example you know he's a he's a team leader um, you know but in you know in other circumstances he, he might be on domestic duty it's got to be people portato hasn't it Chira. Hey, Pippo Pozzato, I saw him uh, in this final and uh, I can't imagine something about his future, but stay tuned, listeners, because in the next podcast, not today, because I'm not allowed, but we could reveal something more important about Pippo Pozzato's future. Pippo Pozzato. No, Chino has just got up and marched off. He's running away. Maybe he's off to file his Pippo Pozzato story. We've got it. We, we have got to give people. Pippo Pozzato was off the bike today. I think he crashed. He was caught up in the crash. Daniel, we've got to give people Pozzato, Peddler de Charme at some point. Should we just do it? Should we just do it today? Should we make a unilateral decision? Pippo Pozzato. Can you, can you organise that tomorrow? Yeah, no problem. No sweat. You're going to get a tour of the Lamprey bus, aren't you, as well? Daniel? Daniel? Where's he gone? Where's Chiro gone? Well, he's just run off with his laptop and he's got work to do, I'm assuming. Another question, Steve Perryman. What's the one moment you wish you'd recorded for the podcast but missed? I tried yesterday to record uh, John Degenkolb's outburst. Um, There was a lot of raised voices at the finish again today, actually. Mainly Greipel yelling, but in joy uh, rather than rage. I mean, Degenkolb's uh, really lost his temper after the stage and I tried to get my recorder on, but because I've got a new memory, big memory card, and it takes ages to switch on, and I couldn't quite react quickly enough. Annoying. Lesson for the future, though. Always be. I remember a couple of years ago, you caught some great audio, maybe last year, um, when Andrew Talansky and Simon Gerrans clashed in the finish in L- Lyon, or somewhere in the south of France. When Talansky crashed, they came across the line shouting and screaming at each other, and Daniel caught that on tape, which we, we played in the podcast. But moments like that are, are, are great when you can catch them. They are. Any more questions there, Rich, that we, we want to run through? How many peages did I reverse out of today? Um, none today, but, but one yesterday, which involved getting the lorry behind me to reverse first. He wasn't, he wasn't best pleased about that. Um, here's a question from Matthew McIntyre. Um, the new dimension data stuff not adding too much value yet. 
Um, any rumours of good applications of it coming soon? It's been a bit of a damp squib, hasn't it? The Dimension Data and Dan Dan Lloyd, friend of the podcast, Dan Lloyd posted some stats last night about average speeds and so on, which just seemed plain wrong. They they couldn't possibly have been right. And if it's not, I think Dan made the point himself. Um, data can be incredibly useful, but if it's not good data, then it's not worth much. It's a kind of they're rolling it out, aren't they? This is a kind of beta test for this data. So you know, I'm sure they're using the tour to iron it all out. But I did see on the stage to the Murdehui, the they tried to compare Froome's um, climbing speed with Nibali's climbing speed, and it was kind of. It's a bit like when you're riding a bike with a, a GPS unit on the handlebars and it goes a bit erratic and you you know it's not really giving you particularly accurate information. And it just looked a little bit like that. But I think maybe as it beds in, you know, the potential is there, but perhaps having a few teething problems. A little bit like this, this debut live cycling podcast from the Tour de France. Yeah, well, I was about to say, I mean, in cycling, things do tend to be a little bit amateurish and slipshod, don't they? Um, <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, a, a system like or uh, an innovation like the the data that's being used on the tour, you can't imagine it being wheeled out for, for example, the Champions League in football and not being completely ready. But in football, I'm um, sorry, in cycling, a, a bit like some of the GoPro footage that Velon released early in the year, it wasn't especially well produced. It's improving, but um, it's it ultimately comes down to lack of resources, doesn't it? Well, sorry, I was sorry. just going to say on that point about the Velon video, I mean, I think we were all struck by the sort of power of the Orica Green Edge mechanic as he reacted to the terrible crash the other day, um, getting out of the car, running down to the scene of the crash, and it was really quite uncomfortable viewing. I'm sure, uh, more, well, more people have list- watched that than listened to this podcast, so I can't imagine many people have missed it. But if you have, get onto YouTube and search for that footage. It's about seven or eight minutes, and the thing about it was the really jarring uncomfortable thing was to hear the moans of riders who'd been hurt in the crash something you never get on tv um and i think when you see a crash like that on tv yeah you wince a bit and you go that looks terrible um but it's there's almost a kind of cartoonish element i don't mean that disrespectfully i mean there's a kind of you're detached from it and that video from the orica mechanic really brought home exactly what it is like reacting to one of those crashes and he was busy for seven or eight minutes checking bikes checking on the health of the riders um, and it was it was it's a really sort of that's a genuine insight that Velon Velon have provided there. Uh, late change to Pedlar de Charme is going to be Pierre Luc Perrichon after all the okay. the échappé today. Um, People Posato will have to wait another day. Hopefully he'll remain in the tour long enough to be awarded Pedlar de Charme at some point. Can I do a couple of quick thank yous? And um, we we have to wrap up probably quite soon, but. A couple of thanks I missed last night. Thank you to Nigel Brown of Dirt and Glory Media for all his help. Um, as I said yesterday, read John McCleary's live blog at telegraph.co.uk, the best live blog on the Tour de France. And thanks to 13 Senses, whose song Home you hear in Kilometre Zero, which is our morning podcast. In particular, friend of the podcast and 13 Senses lead guitarist Tom Wellham, whose other band, Glass Pear, supply the music for our regular podcasts outside of the Tour de France. So thank you to Tom, thank you to 13 Senses. Um, another quick question from Cycling Mad. What are your thoughts on Edval Bosenhagen and his chances of winning a stage? Daniel, I think you had some information on Bosenhagen. I, I understand that he was going extremely well going into this Tour de France. Um, he is a delicate flower though, isn't he? Um... He, that has been the case throughout his career. The, this year at MTN, I think he's getting on better than he was at Sky. I think he's happier. That is the kind of vir- environment that he needs to be in. Uh, a very sort of familiar, kind of convivial environment. Um, and I I actually thought he had a great chance yesterday in in the stage. Um, had Tony Martin not gone away, but in fact he didn't sprint particularly well, I don't think, yesterday. Um, tomorrow might be an opportunity for him. Love, uh, it's an uphill finish. On paper, it looks perfect for Peter Sagan. There might be some splits before we get to that sprint. So that's a, a very good opportunity for him. Um, MTN Quebec, their intake, this influx of very fast riders, experienced riders, has not really been a huge success, has it, since the start of the season? Matt Goss wasn't even in the shake-up, really, for selection. Tyler Farrar is he's now really working as a lead-out man. Theo Boss has been slightly disappointing. Um, and Brassenhagen has flown the flag to a certain extent, but he really could do with some good results here at the Tour, couldn't he? One final question, chaps. Uh, Peter Kirk asks, just to check, is the Tour still the Tour? Uh, the Tour is always a Tour, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. This is the Tour. Um, we're here to the end. 
the, was the tour the tour when it stopped there, when Prudy stopped it the other day? Because um, I don't know if you caught it, you chaps, but Patrick Lefebvre, was, he, he seemed to mimic Richard in um, him posting a very knee-jerk tweet, a very impulsive tweet saying that this set a very dangerous precedent, stopping the race um, because there were, the ambulances couldn't get to the casualties. However, he doubled the dose the next day in Le Keep. I don't know if you saw that. He really went for it, and um, he very much stood by what he had said at the time, that it, it wasn't something that should, should have happened or should ever happen again. Uh, just maybe, so I said that was final question, but one final, final question, because I, I call out this question. Cycling Challenge, that's at Cycling Alps, asks, will you watch any stages on the side of the road or all in the media room? Definitely side of the road. You've got to get out there and watch the race. Stand with the people who are watching the race, and I think you just you 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 pick up so much of the sort of atmosphere, the ambiance, the feeling of being roadside. Um, that that kind of frantic dash of the final vehicles before the tour arrives, the helicopters in the air. It's you never fail to be excited by that, no matter how many tours you've been to. No, well, I did exactly that yesterday, and another plug for our Kilometre Zero show. Um, you can hear about a sort of day out on the cobbles, the publicity caravan, met a few interesting characters, and that will be going out, uh, I think, on Friday, our Friday morning show, that will be. Uh, cobbles, etc., I think we're going to call it. So, yeah, and, and hopefully, you know, it's difficult, isn't it, when you're working and you've got other things to do to sort of indulge by going and standing on the side of the road but it's never anything less than a kind of in, enjoyable um, enjoyable afternoon I don't know whether you get a chance to do that much Daniel no not really <laughs> <laughs> but even standing at the finish line and watching them come in on a, you know when, when you're waiting for the riders at, near the buses go and stand down by the finish line and just see them rush towards you on a, on a day like today it, it, it's uh, yeah it's enjoyable isn't it yeah, it is, but, you know, earlier I, I asked you questions and you just ignored. So, you know, I'm not going to indulge you. I asked you whether you'd seen the thing that Patrick Lefebvre said in L'Equipe. You just ignored it. On to the next question. Bulldozer to head. <laughs> Goodness me. Goodness me. I think I nodded, Daniel. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of on the mixed desk here. You know, I'm concentrating on several things at once, you know, trying not to cock too much of it up. Um, hopefully, people out there have been listening to this and hopefully... Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, if this has been a, deemed a success, we will do it again next Wednesday and again on the final Wednesday of the tour. Yeah, so we're going to say cheerio now. Is that it? Question. Oh, Daniel, God, you're demanding. Um, would you change the rules to avoid the GC teams interfering with the sprinter teams in the last kilometres? Asked Martin Shaw. The question is, what do you do? I mean, do you move the neutralised zone another 2k back or 10k back? I actually think this should be dealt with in the way that most problems in cycling were dealt with once upon a time with kind of shady mafia-style agreements whereby the sprinters' teams and the GC riders' teams just get together and talk about it and have have a tacit um, agreement not to not to interfere with each other. No? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it, the 3K rule? I mean, it was noticeable today um, when they were coming up to the, the finish um, that the kind of the GC teams that have been there for maybe 6, 7K out, pretty much they go past the 3K to go sign and then, you know, they disperse and settle back in. And, you know, it's one of those rules that does have a quite a significant effect on the racing on days like this. And it's not the free for all that it was before. But then, you know, who's to say it hasn't sort of, you know, it hasn't made us made the sprints a little bit safer. Richard. Sorry, I wasn't listening to that, Lionel. Um, I think we should probably <laughs> wrap things up there. We've got to go and have, have dinner a second night in a row at the at the in-laws. Um, which Oh, oh dear! Oh dear! Things are crashing down. A moment of symbolism there at the end of the first live podcast. The, the press room is falling apart around all around us. It started with me breaking the chair. Do you think this has been a bit like going to see a band you really you quite like and they're not as good live? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's very like that, very like that. But we're going to be much slicker next week. I think this this was a this was a practice, and this will be available for people to listen to, won't it? After the events, this will be our podcast tonight. Um, thank you to Jaguar for sponsoring us. Thank you to everyone who's listened and who will be listening after it's up as a recorded episode. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. 
For the best analysis, discussions and interviews from the 2015 Tour de France, listen to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.